Hey, hey, here we are. This is His Word Unveiled. Today, we are finishing up the book of Isaiah, so pretty big deal. So excited. I believe that God has something great for us. Let's get into our reading. This video is going to cover the last two chapters of the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah chapters 65 and 66 is what we're hitting today. So you know what to do. Let's finish well. Finish well meaning it's just the beginning of something more, of something new, of whatever God is going to take us into next. So Let's do this thing. Now is the time where you're going to sit in the presence of the Lord. You're going to read and you're going to read to learn and read with purpose and read just so the Lord can do something in you, bring about change, stir things up within you. It's going to mean something. It's going to be powerful because when we go to the Lord in purpose, then he shows up. He rewards us. He is our rewarder and he is a righteous God. We've been reading um, about that truth that is soaked in the book of Isaiah, just this understanding that he is a righteous God. He is all about righteousness and salvation, and he desires to pour it upon us. So let's go after him. Let's go after his heart. Go sit, read, take your time, you know, break things apart, really um, go through thoroughly and, and not rushing through and really just letting things happen. So excited. Isaiah chapters 65 and 66. Let's finish up well so that we can be ushered into a new beginning of more and more and more of what God has for us. Here we go. You're going to read. I'm going to pray. And here we go. Oh, Lord, we thank you for today. We just praise you. Lord, you are, are the only God. You are the only way, the truth, and the life. Father, we choose today to meet with you. We choose to be moved by you. We choose to learn. We want to see your newness. We want to see you in your glory. Father, we are diving in deep, believing that you are going to show up in ways that we cannot even imagine. We just pray that you overwhelm us, that you pour out your goodness. Lord, we just want, we just want everything we do and everything that we are to just be consumed with a realness, a bigness, and a realness. We want, to, um, we want to live life. We choose to live life in that way. Father, we love you. We need you. And we just ask for you to meet us today as we walk through your word, your truth. Father, let it come alive to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Isaiah chapter 65. Let's go at it. Okay, the very beginning, the first few verses uh, verses 1 and 2, God is just speaking and saying um, that he's repeatedly made himself available to a people who did not want him, who did not want or care if he was available. That the Lord said, I continue to stretch out my hand to a rebellious people, to you in your rebellion. At the end of verse 2, who walk in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts. So just stuck in themselves all just in the, the things and their thoughts and their ways and their plans. And God says, when you did that, I continue to pursue you. I continue to pour myself out upon you, offering you all the goodness in the world, giving you this salvation. So God says, I did that continually in my faithfulness. Then we see in verse three, a people who continually provoke me to my face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on bricks. He continues in talking about how they are unclean. That, that God loves even them, that this salvation is for them and giving them an opportunity to return to the Lord, to have their eyes open to see and to come back to the Lord. But God calls them out and says, me and my faithfulness, but this is you and your rebellion. Being unclean, we see at the end of verse 4. Verse 5 speaks about pride and hypocrisy. Uh, verse 6 and 7 it's just talking about the judgment of the Lord because of their rebellion. It says, behold, it is written before me. I will not keep silent, but I will repay. This is the Lord speaking. I will even repay into their bosom, both their iniquities, their own iniquities, and the iniquities of their fathers together, says the Lord. So he says judgment is coming. And we see this more in, um, more in the rest of the chapter, but verse 8 at the end of verse 8, it says, So I will act on behalf of my servants in order not to destroy all of them. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob and an heir of my mountains from Judah. Even my chosen one shall inherit it, and my servants will dwell there. Verse 10 at the very end, For my people who seek me. So the Lord is speaking 
He is saying, I'm a righteous God. I'm going to punish the wicked, yes. And there are rebellious people. There are people who are rejecting me as I am pouring myself out. But there are also those who are returning to me. Those are There are also those who are repenting and coming to me in humility. And those are my people. Those are the ones who are choosing to be my people, who are saying, we want you to be our God. And the Lord is saying, when I come in judgment and wiping out wickedness, I am a righteous God. And I see those. I see those in righteousness and I see those in wickedness and I will act accordingly and I will be righteous even in that punishing the wicked and sparing the righteous. So um, in verse eight, we see that. So I will act on behalf of my servants in order not to destroy all of them. That God is a righteous God. He reigns and rules in justice, with justice, being fair. And in his omnipotence, in his omniscience and knowing and seeing all things, he is able to rule with righteousness and rule in his faithfulness. Um, So he is talking then, God is saying, seriously, no matter what comes, no matter what you see, no matter what happens, no matter what judgments come about, I'm a righteous God and I see you and I've got you and you will be rewarded. Then in verse 11, we see, but you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune, and who fill cups with mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you for the sword, and all of you will bow down to the slaughter before I call, because I called, but you did not answer. I spoke, but you did not hear. And you did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. So God is saying, those of you who keep rejecting me, who are not responding to this opportunity that I give and laying out my salvation for you, the sword will come against you. These judgments will come against you. God is a righteous God. Verse 13, it continues. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, my servants will eat, but you will be hungry. Behold, my servants will drink, but you will be thirsty. Behold, my servants will rejoice, but you will be put to shame. Verse 14 continues in this message and saying, behold, my servants will shout joyfully with a glad, a glad heart, but you will cry out with a heavy heart and you will wail with a broken spirit. You will leave your name for a curse to my chosen ones and the Lord God will slay you, but my servants will be called by another name. So the Lord, we just see his righteousness. We see the difference between the righteous and the wicked. God doesn't just, you know, wipe out the righteous along with the wicked. He doesn't allow, rewards don't look the same for those living in in wickedness and living in righteousness. God sees, and he is a righteous God, a righteous judge. There is a huge difference. We see the end result is a huge difference from those living in righteousness from those as God's servants, being able to eat and drink and rejoice and and shout joyfully with a glad heart. And then those in wickedness, those choosing and saying, we don't want the Lord. There's a difference. The result of them, it's different. It says that they'll continue to be hungry. They'll continue to be thirsty. They won't be satisfied. They'll have a heavy heart. They'll have a broken spirit. This is what it is. Those things have to be. It makes sense because God, God holds all, all joy. All gladness, all peace, all of this goodness in life. And when we reject him, when we say, no, thanks God, we can't expect to have all the blessings of God and not be connected to him, not have this relationship with him, not know him. If we don't know him, the source of where all this goodness comes from, then we can't expect expect to have it poured out into our lives. This just screams the righteousness of God, the difference in that God truly does see, and he acts in his righteousness. Um, against wickedness and and toward and for those who are living in righteousness. Okay, verse 17, we'll jump down there. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. The Lord is saying, I am all about a newness. I have created everything, everyone, with and for a purpose. And when we turn away from that purpose, God says, don't you worry. If you return to me, if you choose to seek my face, then you will live. Then you will be blessed. And there will be a newness upon you that I will restore what I created you for. There will be a restoration back to your original purpose. I love this in 18. For behold, I create Jerusalem. For rejoicing and her people for gladness. 
our purpose. It screams our purpose, what we were created for, for gladness, the joy of our salvation. Again, it comes back to why we were created. Our purpose is to be found in the Lord. God's desire, the desire of his heart is for salvation. Is, is of righteousness, is being faithful, is allowing us to see the power of our purpose and bringing us into relationship with him. It goes back to the beginning, and I love this idea of restoration, that when he comes in with restoration, when he comes in to restore, he's restoring us to what has always been, to what was established from the beginning that he created us, covering, protecting us, that word say there, so that we were and could be in relationship with him, found in that connection with him, knowing our creator, knowing what he has for us, knowing our purpose, and that our purpose is to know God, to know him as our Lord, as our Savior. Verse 19 says, I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people, and there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. So God in his healing, in his restoration. It just screams then blessings, and he continues in, this is what I made Jerusalem for. This is what, this is the purpose in in living in these blessings, living the living in the abundance of these blessings of this life. Verse 21, they will build houses and inhabit them. They will also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit. They will not plant and another eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so will be the days of my people and my chosen ones will wear out the work of their hands. So the Lord says, no, you're going to work hard and it's not going to be in vain. We see that in verse 23, they will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. For they are the offspring of those blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. Purpose. This screams purpose, that God has a purpose for our lives. We don't, anything we do in the name of the Lord, when we trust, when we choose to praise him, when we could complain, when we choose to to grumble about things, you know, when we have every right to do so, but instead, when we trust the Lord, when we seek God, when we remember him, when we stand on his truth, when we do all of those things, every single step that we take, when a thought comes into mind about whatever jealousy, comparison, feeling envious, whatever all of this stuff is, in those moments when we say, I take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, I am choosing to set my mind on things above, in every single step that we take in that, taken in and toward righteousness, God sees and it's blessed, and it is not in vain. It's not in vain. Every single step of obedience, every single every single step that we take towards righteousness, there's purpose in it. There is reward for it. They will not labor in vain. That's what his word speaks. Verse 24, it will also come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Just the faithfulness of God we hear in verse 24. Verse 25 screams the peace of God. The wolf and the lamb will graze together and the lion will eat straw like the ox and dust will be the serpent's food. They will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. This is the life we have when we choose God. This rolls us into the very last chapter of Isaiah. Let's hit it. Chapter 66. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? This is talking about the bigness of God. Heaven is his throne, that he sits upon heaven in his bigness. The earth is my footstool, that he can prop his feet up on all of earth, that that's his footstool, the bigness of God, that he can take care of things. That kind of business or bigness, he can take care of things. He is, he is fully capable of dealing with anything and everything. Verse 2 says, For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. In all of God's power, in all of his bigness, he sees those who are low. He blesses those who are humble. We've read it throughout his word, how his heart just is so delighted with those who choose humility, with those who choose to remain low and to lift him high. He sees them. No matter how big he is, he sees every small detail, every small step that we take in obedience, in humility, 
and remaining low and seeking him out, seeking his face. God sees it and he is delighted in it. But this one I will look. He looks upon. He smiles. It makes the heart of God smile when we choose humility. Okay. Then it goes into talking about um, those who are wicked, that he also sees those who are proud, those in their wickedness. So we see at the end of verse 3, the very end of verse 3, as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. Verse 4 says, so I will choose their punishments and will bring on them what they dread because I called, but no one answered. I spoke, but they did not listen. And they did evil in my sight and chose that in which I did not delight. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brothers who hate you, who exclude you from my name's sake. Let's jump down to verse 6. A voice of uproar from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who is rendering recompense to his enemies. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she gave birth to a boy. The Lord just lays out, hey, I see those in righteousness. I see those in wickedness, and I'm a righteous God. So he is laying out a voice of uproar from the city. This is this is judgment sweeping in against, against uh, the righteous, um, their enemies, against those who are coming up against them, who are rejecting the Lord. The Lord will see through his judgment. So we see in verses 9 and 10, it's talking about that God is not a God of threats. He is not. What he speaks, it will be fulfilled. He will see through all of these judgments. The same note, he will see through all of his rewards, all of his blessings, all of his promises that they will be fulfilled. We see that in verses 7 um, through 11 and on even. So, um, it's talking to, giving this message of, we may go through the severity and the intensity of a labor, but peace is at hand. His righteousness is near. So though all of this is coming in in full force and severity and intensity and it doesn't feel good and it's not comfortable, though it's coming on strong that his blessings are flowing behind, that they will come in, they will usher in like the mercy of God coming in like this um, like this, this strong current of these judgments, we've got to see him as, hey, this is the mercy of God, that though this doesn't feel good at this time, God is doing something, he's up to something, he's shaping things, he's moving things around, and we can see it as the mercy of God, that we can be awakened to his truth, and we can respond to him. Verse 12, for thus says the Lord, behold, I extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the nations like an overflowing stream and you will be nursed you will be carried on the hip and fondled on the knees so the lord says i am taking care of you though these judgments come in those you're going to though you're going to see what's going on what's taking place i will take care of you my peace is coming shortly my peace is here my righteousness is near no matter what you see and feel i am at work he speaks in 13 you will be comforted in Jerusalem, verse 14, then you will see this and your heart will be glad and your bones will flourish like the new grass and the hand of the Lord will be made known to his servants, but he will be indignant toward his enemies. Again, that difference, that stark difference between the wicked and the righteous. God does it. He is a fair God. He's a just God. And when we look around and sometimes say, this doesn't seem fair. This person isn't living for the Lord. Why are they getting all this? This person doesn't tithe. Why do they have all this money? This this and that, and we go there, and we have got to understand, we have got to come back to the truth and say God is a righteous God. He will take care of us. We don't need to freak out. We don't need to worry. We don't need to be full of fear. We can trust the Lord. He is a righteous God. If we haven't got that message yet, reading through, um, through his word unveiled, reading through the book of Isaiah and even other books, if we haven't got that planted, like so engraved upon our hearts that God is a righteous God, Guys, then we're, we're missing it. That message has been screamed. That should be so engraved on our hearts. Like we should not, we should not budge from that. No matter what happens, we should always be able to come back and say he's a righteous God. It, his word screams that over and over and over again. So powerful. And those, that's what we've got to stand on. That's the power of his word and knowing and saying, no, I read through. I, through the whole word, we are told that God is a righteous God, that we can stand on that. We can stand on him in that faithfulness. Verse 15, for behold, the Lord will come in fire 
and his chariots like the whirlwind, to render his anger with furry, and his rebuke with flames of fire. For the Lord will execute judgment by fire and by his sword on all flesh, and those slain by the Lord will be many. Those who sanctify and purify themselves to go to the gardens, following one in the center who eats swine's flesh, detestable things, and mice will come to an end together. So those being full of hypocrisy, being full of pride, just moving to move, and not seeking the Lord, not being authentic, not being sincere, not being intentional, not living with an end purpose. Those judgments will come if we're not responding to these wake-up calls that God is giving us, these opportunities to come back to the Lord to run back to him. We're missing it. We're missing it. We're getting caught up and we will be swept away in the punishment of the wickedness. That's just the reality of it. It's we're either seeking the Lord or we're seeking everything else. Verse 18, for I know their works and their thoughts. They are meaning those in wickedness. The Lord is speaking this, for I know their works and their thoughts. The time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. That these judgments are coming with and in a purpose, so that the world will have an opportunity to come to the Lord. That they will know Him. That they will see Him in His glory. Okay. Uh, verse 20, then this talks about the remnant and talks about the restoration again. Then they shall bring all your brethren from all the nations as a grain offering to the Lord on horses and chariots and litters, on mules and on camels to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord. Just as the sons of Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. Let's go to verse 22. For just as the new heavens and the new earth which I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. So the Lord is all about newness. And he said, just as the new heavens and the new earth that God will create, um, that they will endure, that those things that God creates, this newness will endure. He says, so your offspring and your name will endure. As we seek the Lord, as we go after him, as we choose his righteousness, then our name, our blessing, our reward, our identity being found and connected in the Lord will endure. Verse 23, and it shall be from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. So yes, this is like, uh, like really heavy finishing up the book of Isaiah, but at the same time, on the same note, it screams again how righteous God is, that those seeking him, those in righteousness, that we will go forth and look. That those who choose that will go forth and look on the corpses of men who have transgressed against me. That we will know God is our defender. We will know God is righteous. We will know God sees. We will know God makes all wrong right. God will take care of it. We do not need to freak out, stress out, worry, strive, try to fix things, deal with things, make things okay, make things peaceful. That's not our job. Our job is to know God. Our job is to stand on the truth that he defends, that he takes care of it, that he's fighting for us, that he sees. If we're so busy and worked up trying to deal with the wicked and trying to, to make things okay in our life, then we miss out on just seeking righteousness. We miss out on choosing to live abundantly in the present, um, in the presence of the Lord and being present and being positioned in stillness in him. That's where our power is. That's when we see things change. That's when we see things right and transformed and beautified and at peace and brought together. That's God's job. He does that. We just read about his bigness, about how faithful he is, how strong and powerful he is. And in that bigness, he sees. In that bigness, he chooses to look. He, he, he's looking for those who are humbling themselves, who are being intentional about knowing the Lord, not getting back at the wicked, not, not trying to protect themselves, not trying to make situations right or, or clear up misled statements or, or going at someone and, oh, we got to talk this through because what you said is wrong and what you did was wrong. And guys, push that aside. That, that, there's nothing in that. Nothing will come from that. God says, I am defender. I am a righteous God. I'm the one who brings salvation. I'm the one who makes all the wrong right. We have got to trust in the Lord. And hearing through Isaiah and, and the word and the way that God spoke through Isaiah 
in the book of Isaiah is so powerful and gives us every reason in the world to be assured, to stand firm, to stand on his promises and say, I, I can take myself out of this. I can take my strength. I can take my plans. I can take my ways out of everything in life. God's got me. My fight, our fight, our job, the only thing we need to be focused on is knowing the Lord, is growing in Him, is being found rooted and still in His presence. And as we remain there, then we are empowered to see God at work. We, we are... Our vision and, and our perspective, it's not clouded. We, In that, as we remain in the Lord, it's clear. We see, we hear, we're naturally moved into what matters. And we see accomplishments. We see success. We have victory. We live in freedom. Those are the kind of things that happen when we take ourselves out of the picture. When we say, it's not up to me. Our fight needs to be getting to the Lord. Our fight needs to be seeking Him. Our fight needs to be led into righteousness because He is a righteous God. He is our righteous judge. And He rewards those who choose righteousness. He rewards those who run after Him, who seek Him daily. There are rewards in every step of obedience we take towards Him. And he punishes the wicked. He will take care of the wicked just as this ends. And they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. We will look on the corpses of men. Those in righteousness will look on the corpses of men who have transgressed against me. God is a righteous God. He will take care of it. And in those judgments, mercy is, mercy is given. All mankind have an opportunity to come into salvation with and in him. He is a righteous God. We can stand on that, and that can change our lives. That can empower us to live abundantly and freely in Him. He rewards those in righteousness. <sighs> that finishes up the book of Isaiah. Love that. May that just stick with us and soak in our souls. Seriously, may it truly change us. It can and it will. If we want it to, it will. Because the Lord says, if you seek me, you will find me. I am standing on the truth of God. I am standing on his promises, knowing that he is righteous. He is faithful. He is all about salvation. He fights for us. He loves us. I'm standing right there. I'm not moving. I'm not being shaken by that because that truth, it's powerful. That truth can take us super deep. That's where I'm choosing to go. So come along with me. Let's keep going along this journey and going deeper and finding out more. So we have finished the book of Isaiah. Cannot wait for a new beginning, where God takes us next, what he teaches us next. There's so much more in store for us because he's a faithful God and so full of righteousness. Okay, we're done. That's it. Ending on that note, thanks so, so much for walking this through. I trust and pray that God is doing just amazing things, real things that are going to last. Not just these feel-good things, but real things. He is a God of movement, and man, is He working. Okay, that's good. Thanks again. Um, I guess we'll start up something new in our next video. Cannot wait. Um, that's it. See you soon.